desire. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we'll be exploring the Cenobites featured in the works of Clive Barker, including his novellas The Hellbound Heart and The Scarlet Gospels, as well as the numerous Hellraiser films, some of which were discussed in my video on Pinhead the Hell Priest last year, which I'll be leaving a link to below. The Cenobites, also known as the Surgeons by Makalota the Witch in Barker's Weave World, are essentially extra-dimensional beings that were all disfigured, sexless, and sadomasochistic. Hailing from a religious sect in Hell known as the Order of the Gash, where they describe themselves as explorers in the further regions of experience. The entities are in essence a type of demon created from the souls of mortals who had given into forbidden, hedonistic, and often disturbing forms of pleasure. Originally all humans, with the exception of one of them, which I'll discuss a bit later, each one of the Cenobites had sought to extend their reach over the human experience, leading to them being tortured, disfigured, and brainwashed into torturing others for all eternity within the labyrinth, under the direction and control of Leviathan, the god of flesh, hunger, and desire, who is considered by some to have originally been a fallen angel. As mentioned just before, almost all the Cenobites were once human, with the exception of Angelique, the demon princess of Hell, who was the daughter of Leviathan himself, your human admirer may not sense it, but I can smell the exquisite stench of what you really are. In the expanded series, it's explained that the servants of Leviathan can only reach Earth's reality through a schism in time and space that is open and closed with certain unearthly artifacts, usually a puzzle box that promised the user pleasure. When a person solves one of these boxes, be it the Carbaro or the Lament configuration, they would soon find themselves surrounded by a group of Cenobites. And if Leviathan believed the person was worthy enough to become one of his servants, they are taken away to be turned into a Cenobite. However, if a person is deemed unworthy, they would either be destroyed through torturous means, or they would find themselves transported into Hell, where they would be forced to experience unimaginable pain for eternity. The word Cenobite is actually Latin for common life and has been used since the medieval age to describe a form of monastic lifestyle within the various monotheistic religions. Cenobites, by this definition, are clerics who have chosen to interact with the outside world while living within an interdimensional monastery known as the Labyrinth. As for the means with regards to how the Cenobites are created, this is explored within the second and third Hellraiser movies, where it's explained that throughout human history, specific owners of the Lament configuration had been transformed into transcendental acolytes by the entity called Leviathan upon solving the said box. Both films also reveal that humans who suffer from severe mental trauma or a form of mental psychosis are prone to indulge themselves in unconventional forms of pleasure and end up leading a hedonistic and often sadistic lifestyle. For example, in Hellbound, the character Philip Chouinard is revealed to have been a mutilator since childhood. In Hell on Earth, the character Colonel Elliot Spencer was once a World War I vet suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and survivor's guilt before his transformation into Pinhead. Inevitably, people such as these ended up discovering the Lament configuration, would solve the box and were then dragged into the labyrinth. Once there, Leviathan would have these people tossed into chambers in which they received violence and permanent body modifications consisting of gashes, scars, piercings and lacerations. Their clothing consists of custom-made black leather bodysuits, specifically designed as an amalgam of Catholic cows and BDSM leather latex suits, and their design would also incorporate the covering up of their genital organs, rendering the Cenobites' gender uncertain. Disturbingly enough, these suits are directly attached onto the Cenobites' bodies by means of hooks, chains, wires, and pins, which meant that once they were in the service of Leviathan, the Cenobites were essentially in a perpetual state of pain. Many of these demons also carried weapons or instruments of torture with them, and some even had these devices permanently molded into their bodies via unnatural transplantation. Once the entire transformation was complete, these human husks would then be charged with torturing future recipients who also solved the puzzle of the Lament configuration. One of the things I found most interesting about these dark entities is that upon changing into interdimensional beings, they would not be able to remember their past, and we see an example of this in Hellbound, where neither Pinhead nor his entourage were aware of their human origins until Kirsty showed them a picture of Colonel Elliot Spencer. Subsequently, though they were immensely powerful, especially against humans, once they'd been killed, the Cenobites would actually revert back to their initial human form. Within Barker's extended literature, the Cenobites are often nicknamed by their outward appearance, and some of the more famous are Pinhead, named after the self-inflicted pin mutilation over his head, Butterball, a horribly obese Cenobite, and Chatterer, named after his horrific facial deformity that left him with exposed teeth and gums. Every Cenobite's deformity and mutilation, as well as choice of weapon or lack thereof, is also individual, with the exception of their leather clothing, which seems to be a standard uniform for all members of the Order of the Gash. 
Within the first film, I also felt as though the Cenobites were portrayed as neutral beings that were neither good nor evil, and they even say this themselves with the quote about them being demons to some, angels to others. While they were originally intelligent entities who, while repulsive, also displayed an unsettling grace especially with regards to how they spoke, when opposed, the Cenobites were not above using terror to pursue their prey, highlighting that although they were not truly malevolent, they were still merciless forces of nature that were not to be trifled with. Having said that, as the series of films grew, the Cenobites changed and became more and more like the stereotypical western portrayal of demons that were obsessed with domination and the apocalyptic style torturing of humanity as a whole, in direct opposition to a Cenobite's nature in the novel and first film, where they only wished to torture the one who summoned them. Considering Clive Barker had written and directed the first Hellraiser film whilst also writing and producing its sequel, and since he basically had no hand in the somewhat questionable cash grab films that followed, I'm personally more inclined to follow the ideology created by Barker. There are going to be moments when the audience is going to be uh, stunned by the elegance and the beauty of the image at the same time as being appalled by the subject matter. And that's a very interesting tension and paradox. Throughout the series, we're told that each Cenobite has a vast array of supernatural powers due to his or her connection to Hell, as well as their own unnatural mutation, in addition to the unique weapons and instruments of torture that some of them possessed. The physical composition of Cenobites gives them a number of unique abilities, but there were a few traits common to all. For example, when summoned, they seem to be able to decide exactly when and where and by what means they will appear. The entities also stalked their prey and were able to track the souls who summoned them. Their enhanced physical attributes enabled them to throw humans around like ragdolls, and their low-level telekinesis gave them a measure of control over hook chains, which was essentially their trademark. It's also important to note that although they can drag individuals back to hell, they actually lack the ability to freely roam back and forth from hell without the lament configuration. They each seem to possess the ability to shapeshift, they have enhanced durability, they can create illusions to trick their prey, and even seem to have some degree of supernatural empathy. They also tend to be rather sharp, patient, logical and discerning. A stark contrast to the monsters we're used to seeing during the 80s and 90s that were usually stupid, illogical brutes bent on destruction. A change that Barker wanted to introduce into the mainstream. The powers of the Cenobites also vary for each of them, the most notable example of course being Pinhead, who is probably the most powerful and who has the low level reality warping ability, and who has also been shown to have near limitless powers at his disposal, to the point that he could even transform humans into Cenobites upon death, as was seen in Hellraiser 3 when Pinhead created a small army of Cenobites from his victims. Their great knowledge of the limits of both pleasure and pain, which made them masters of both physical and psychological torture, coupled with their supernatural ability, served to make the Cenobites arguably amongst the most frightening and dangerous representations of demons in fiction. In the Greek myths, for instance, which were really the first myths that I looked at seriously, are not troubled by personality. They're into some more absolute place. And that was always my, uh, that was always what fascinated me. I will do all that I need to, to convince an audience of the reality of the character who is about to take the adventure, and no more. Horror is not just a genre for Barker, it's an expression of self. Even as a youngster, Clive was never interested in the mundane or normal, and his mind was always piqued by legends and aspects of the fantastique, like those found in Greek mythologies. And his approach to writing, which reflects this, often involved stretching the limits of what can be published to engage people and encourage them into exploring the metaphysics of the extreme worlds and realities he created, to better help them understand their place in the world and their search for life-altering experiences. His obsession with the erotic, the forbidden and the unknown is a reflection of our own desires and needs for exploration in the search for meaning and experiences that we can use to better understand ourselves and the society that we live in. I mean, what else can explain the cult following his books have garnered over the years? Even the 10 Hellraiser films, though I feel like they missed the mark towards the end, the fact that they're still being made and people are still watching them is a testament to our collective boredom with the mundane and ordinary. If you're a fan of the man like myself, I highly recommend that you watch the short documentary interview of his called The Art of Horror, which can be found in the special features of some of the Hellraiser films, and also online, where Barker shares his thought processes when approaching his writings, and sheds some light on how he sees the world around us. Well, that's all for today, folks. Big thanks to all of you guys who requested we take a closer look at the Cenobites featured in the works of Clive Barker. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.